It's time for This Week in Location-Based Marketing, episode number 29, and we're recording this late, late, late one night, June 11th, 2011. My name is Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv, your co-host, and with me as always from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Asif Khan from the Location-Based Marketing Association. And of course, you can find Asif at thelbma.com or at thelbma on Twitter or at Asif R. Khan on Twitter as well. Asif... Uh, episode number 29, full of stuff as usual. Sounds like a broken record, but let me remind everybody what they're doing here. They're listening to this podcast or watching this podcast to keep current on the things that are so important in this industry, in the location-based marketing industry. Uh, a wide sweep of things every week as we go through what's very important. And it actually allows you to do your business properly. So whatever business you're in, if you're interested in location-based marketing, which everybody should be, this is the place to come and get some expert analysis and some of the news items that are the most relevant in the past week. And also we'll talk a little bit about future gazing, about what's going to happen in the next week. Pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and as you say, there's there's always a ton going on and uh, I, th I think we've got some interesting stories this week. So let's uh, let's jump right into it. Well, be before we get into the news, I want to talk about what you what you did, what the LBMA did in uh, New York City this past Wednesday. Uh, you guys hosted an event, an exclusive, a la da exclusive event down there <laughs> in New York City in the Big Apple. Uh, talk about that. Sounded like yeah, it went well. A little different for us. We tried to go a little New York exclusive, as you say, and uh, invite-only private event, and uh, and it worked, I think. Uh, we were we were very uh, privileged to... Uh, have one of our uh, our big agency members, JWT, uh, hosted at their uh, amazing facility. It's it's one of these uh, unbelievable offices you walk into, and it's just all open concept and very modern, and uh, it basically has a nightclub in the middle of the um, uh, of the office. So you know, full bar and everything. So so great facility. Um, and we we had a great turnout, a lot of startups, a uh, bunch of agency uh, folk. Uh, it was part of Internet Week in New York as well, so uh, awesome. it was, you know we, we we made it part of that schedule. And um, yeah, I was very pleased. We had uh, uh, the comments were were extremely positive. We had a guy by the name of uh, Ferris Jacob uh, keynote, and Ferris is uh, one of the chief creative minds over at MDC Partners, and um, always has uh, always gets you thinking. Um, so this that was really interesting and talked about kind of how the concept of places and locations is changing, um, which is very much in sync with the way the LBMA thinks. And then we had a, a, a panel discussion with uh, Phil Thomas DeGuilio, who's kind of a real estate expert uh, in location. Uh, uh, a couple other guys, um, uh, a JWT person that basically talked about retail and brand, and um, and then uh, kind of a sports marketing expert, ex NFL guy, um, talk about use of uh, location in sports. So it was so it was a really good discussion, and uh, you know looking forward to doing more in New York. Yeah, well, New York, what a great city to do this stuff in, and you know based on the activity that I get uh, through on Tether TV and some of the companies that I've interviewed. Uh, yesterday, um, in fact, in real time yesterday on Friday, I interviewed two companies from, from New York City. And I'd say of the 270 or so interviews that I've done, at least 100 of them are, uh, you know, mobile companies that are centered in New York City. And, and uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's split pretty evenly between New York City and the boroughs and, uh, and Silicon Valley. So San Francisco, uh, San Jose, yeah, there, there's a ton going on. I think you know it's evidenced by, I guess it's over a month now. But uh, New York, the city itself, now has a, a chief digital officer. Yeah, I love that. Which, whose mandate is to basically go out and cultivate innovation and make it, you know, a startup capital. So why, so, why doesn't Canada have something like that? Like what? Hey, man alive! I mean, even cities. I, I, I should think have there's that. a job opening for you, isn't there? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like I'm trying to make my own job. Come on. <laughs> Uh, so, city anyways, well, I'm glad I'm glad that it went well, and uh, and I know that you're heading off uh, uh, Sunday for an event out in Banff. Which, if anybody's not been to Banff, it's well worth the drive. Uh, beautiful flying. But uh, let's dive right into what's going on here. Um, uh, you know, a lot a lot to cover in a very short period of time, and um, let's start with this one story, which uh, which I think is is uh, is an interesting play. Uh, Bounce City, Bound City, Bounce City. Uh, Bound launches. City, yeah. And uh, I, I, this is an Indian company. Indonesian. Indonesian yeah. company. Indonesian. 
yes. that is that has basically launched a um, a scavenger competitor. Yeah, so it, it was interesting because I went and, and read a bunch of stories about this thing, and um, what I from what I can tell, the, the the team that put this together, this Indonesian team, basically liked what they were hearing about scavenger over in in in, in the U.S. in particular, and basically traveled over the U.S. played with scavenger. You know, talked to the scavenger team, and then basically said, "Like, we want to build one of these things, but you know, we're, we're going to do that and do it a little bit better and a little bit different." And so, went back to Indonesia and basically built Bount City, and and it comes from a combination of bounty and city. Uh, Bount City is yeah. the explanation I heard. So, and this new word is Bount City. Um, interesting thing about the Indonesian market here is, is there's not a lot of competition. Uh, for location-based services, location-based marketing platforms. I think the only one really in this space is Copral, which uh, Yahoo bought uh, last year. And so, um, you know, so, so I think, you know, it's a wide open market. There's definitely opportunity. And I think it's evidenced by the fact that, um, from what I can tell from press releases and, and articles around this, is that, uh, and so I haven't talked to these guys directly, uh, you know, they basically launch a platform in beta, um, and they've already got listen, listen to the list of names of companies who are on board with this thing for pilots: Excel, McDonald's, Domino's Pizza, Burger King, Dairy Queen, Sour Sally, Celebrity Fitness. You know, some of these I haven't heard of. You know, but the list goes on and on. Um, you know, they've, they've got a big list of of big brands that uh, that are all over this thing. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It just shows the kind of pent-up demand for something like Scavenger. Um, and the, the unique side of it, um, which is obviously the uh, the things that you have to do in these locations. And I wonder if, does this infringe on anything that Scavenger has, like any patents or, or any, any trademarks around kind of this technology, which is, you know, landing in a location, checking in and doing a task? And then no, no, uh, I, no, I don't think so at all. I, 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 first of all, I don't think Scavenger has any patents, really. Hmm. Uh, you know, anything that's defensible in this area. Yeah. I mean, and, and quite frankly, this kind of scavenger hunt, checking, finding stuff. I mean, long before there was Scavenger, you know, we had geocaching, right? Yeah. You know, um, so that's really what it is. And um, long before that, we had scavenger hunts, real exactly. scavenger hunts. Yeah. So you know. Um, so I don't think so. I, I think these guys are, you know, well positioned to be a uh, a domestic play in the market and potentially, you know, an acquisition down the road for somebody who wants to, uh, you know, a North American or European company that wants to grow globally. Well, you know, this is one of those things. Oh uh, yeah, who's buying Copro? Well, yeah, but I would say even is you know, could uh, Bound City actually be a uh, target for Scavenger if they build up enough uh, base? Yeah, yeah, right? potentially. I mean, it's so similar. Obviously, it's, it is scavenger, um, but this is you know I like this play. Scavenger though is not a, a you know is not a a North American play. I mean, scavenger is doing a worldwide uh, push here. Obviously, no, no question, no question. So I, I think it'll be it'll definitely be an interesting uh, conversation if Bound City actually builds up their their uh, you know their subscription list. But you know, it's interesting to see um, you know the purchase price in rupees, right? So, uh, which is which is a very interesting thing. If you look at the at the pricing, uh, you know. Yeah, it's like a million. Uh, yeah. 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 So, a million Indonesian rupees. So, uh, Bounty launches uh, in Indonesia and uh, seems to be just a carbon copy of Scavenger with a little bit extra. So, uh, yep. you know, I, I think that that's good. Good. You know, uh, isn't imitation the greatest form of flattery out there? Absolutely. So they chose Scavenger. That means something, obviously. That Scavenger might be on the right track. Um. Do you want to actually jump into the scavenger story while yeah, we're talking about them? Yeah, let's do it. So, I mean, yeah. since we're talking about scavenger, uh, you know, one, one of the the big uh, stories this week, and sort of follows on, you know, one we talked about last week, which is, you know, the Foursquare 7-Eleven Super 8 combination. Going to space, uh, baby. Week, going to space. All I've been week. doing is drinking big gulps, eh? I've been out there drinking <laughs> yeah, big gulps. Absolutely. So this week, uh, Scavenger sort of responds, so to speak, you know, and obviously, you know, they didn't just put this together in a week. It's something that's that's been they've been working on for a while. But Scavenger plus Subway restaurants uh, around the launch of the new Green Lantern movie. Yes. And um, this is not a national uh, project. So I'll start by saying that it's not U.S. wide. It's only in the L.A. area. 
And I actually have a bit of a personal uh, insight into this. Uh, Paul Bamundo, who uh, runs sports marketing and PR for Subway, was one of the speakers at a conference in New York that I was also speaking at on Wednesday, this past Wednesday. And so we had a brief chat about this. And, uh, and, and what he said to me was, you know, it's a bit of a challenge for them because, you know, the restaurants are all owned by individual, you know, franchise ease. Mm -hmm. And they, ha they have a difficult time forcing national programs uh, onto them like this. And so they said, well, you know, the L.A. market we can somewhat, you know, kind of control and, and kind of work with. And so that's why we're starting there. And hopefully it goes well and we'll be able to roll it out, you know, wider than that. But uh, it is interesting when you hear, you know, those kinds of comments that uh, they just can't, you know, force these things across, you know, every location. Wow. And yet... And yet, Subway is actually the largest in terms of you know actual number of locations. I think they have over over thirty thousand locations or something. Yeah, you know that's the the perils of the um, uh, of a franchise model as well. I mean, right when when you hand it off and you've got individual owners, they're all entrepreneurs and uh, they all own their locations, and some of them own multiple ones. And that's why you go in and some things are on sale and some things aren't on sale, or there's a manager special uh, in some of these these restaurants. Yeah. But the big challenge. I mean, I, this sounds totally unrelated, but it is, is, uh, is Roto-Rooter, right? This is a massive chain in North America. Yeah. And uh, that incident that I had where my, uh, where my entire bathroom exploded on air uh, a while back, uh, I got a good chance to spend three or four hours with a good Roto-Rooter dude who was in here helping me, uh, you know, unclog everything. And uh, I started talking to him about mobile and, uh, and location and uh, a lot of wasted time that he has on his hands. Because he came from the other part of town, which was a 40-minute drive. And, right. you know, there could have been a guy around the corner. So, long story short, I asked him, I said, you know, why, you know, are you guys thinking about mobile? And he said, well, you know, our headquarters is based out of Waco. That's where everything is run from. Each Waco. Home, yeah. Each, uh, so it's Waco, Texas. And each one of our, uh, you, know, you know, each one of our locations is a franchise uh, owner. So, they're independent. So they're looking at mobile, but they're looking at rolling it out in the next, like, in two years, because that's how long it's going to take to integrate across all, right. to make it a, you know, a part of the franchise. And I, I mean, that's, I, I would assume that, uh, that working with a, a big uh, chain like Subway would be the same thing, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, so the, anyway, so that's the challenges. Uh, I do think it's, you know, this is a, this is a good uh, way for, Scavenger, Foursquare, you know, these platforms to, uh, you know, kind of grow the user base by kind of reaching into the consumer, uh, the broader consumer market by, you know, affiliating with uh, things that people are interested in, television, movies, uh, et cetera. And, you know, and partly, you know, this conference I'm going to tomorrow in, in Banff is the uh, television uh, and, and media festival. Um, and I'm there obviously talking about the synergies between location and content. Absolutely. Uh, in particular. And so these are great examples of, you know, the opportunities that are there. And so, you know, you know, not to go too long on this story, but, uh, you know, unlike this one here, you're not winning a trip into space. You know, the big, the big prize here is two free tickets to the uh, premiere in Los Angeles, which is uh, this coming week on the 15th. Um, so, so this you, thing you basically, in you check into a location and there, and you do the task. That's right. And that's how you uh, that's how you enter yourself in for this. Yeah, and there's 1,200 movie tickets and other prizes and things like that as well. So it's not it's not just two tickets to the premiere, but uh, yeah. You know, I I do like these uh, these kinds of part kinds of partnerships. Uh, I mean, I think the big challenge is that um, uh, this is going to be so successful for Scavenger. Other companies like Foursquare or other the mm -hmm. other location services are going to get involved. They have to. They have to start yeah. winning brands. Right? <clears throat> And, yeah, and obviously they make the challenges so that you know they fit in with the theme, right? So yeah. I'm just looking here that the challenges include superhero fuel, which is tell us how to create an out of this world sandwich and create an inventive subway sub with the avocado superfood. Uh, anything I see in my mind, I can create. See, I okay. I like this. Um, yeah, so like they're going right with the movie, and you know, and obviously tying it in Subway. The but second also sourcing called, new sandwich styles, right? Yeah, absolutely. Second challenge, uh, challenge is called "Quote It." Tell us your favorite quote from Green Lantern. Our favorite has to be "I hereby swear allegiance to the Lantern given to me by a dying purple alien." Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
And then the third one is, is called Flex for the Camera. Take a photo next to a Subway logo while flexing your superhero muscles and submit that. So, anyways. I like it. I like yeah, I like well, I like what they're doing, but I mean I'm yeah. a big fan of what uh, Seth has, has done with Scavenger, and I think yeah, yeah, and these guys, you know, as we've talked about before, they've done similar things with the Boston Bruins and Dunkin' Donuts and and other things, right? So it's uh, you know you know I, I really like the positioning of Scavenger. So anyway, so so that's Scavenger plus Subway plus Green Lantern, good promotion. You know, I think it's going to work well. Well, you know, uh, while we're on the the theme of uh, of location based services, let's talk about uh, Jai Peng and uh, what what uh, they just signed uh, Louis Vuitton uh, to uh, uh, actually do a check in. Um, they have a branded page. Um, they they basically partnered with Jai Peng in uh, in China. Yes. So this is this is a big deal because uh, Louis Vuitton is also uh, using Foursquare North America, and and Jai Peng is. Um, the largest uh, check-in service in China, and uh, this this is what's interesting. It's like a million people. That's it. Yeah, that, exactly. And I think you know, China has been really slow to move on on these types of services, but it seems to be finally growing there. There are about fifty uh, location-based apps, from one article I read, uh, that are kind of fighting it out in that market. But yes, Jaipang is the largest. They've got a million users. Um, I think what's interesting about this is, is you know, I talk a lot, as you know, about you know what the driver is for getting consumers on board with location-based marketing, and I always say it's about you know value and relevance, and for a lot of people, for a lot of the skeptics, uh, you know, the way you move them is by you know really having something of value, and and you know Louis Vuitton, you know, is not Subway. Louis Vuitton is not a free pair of jeans at the Gap. Louis Vuitton is a luxury brand, uh, as is you know Jimmy Choo shoes and and some of the other things that we've seen that have you know been out there that have been trying to address the issue of how do we motivate women into this space, and you know Chinese business women um, you know are very fashionable people and uh, you know and spend a lot of money on 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 high end brands. Uh, you know there's lots of evidence to show that. I don't have the stats at hand, but I think this is a good move. So, I mean, what exactly are they doing, these guys? So, you check in at a uh, uh, at an exhibit, um, and uh, you'll get a uh, special Louis Vuitton uh, branded virtual badge, and you basically share the details with with your friends, and you commemorate your trip, and that's that's what you get. Is there anything that's, else? That, yeah, you're not getting any goods or anything like that. Yeah. This 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 is a special badge, but so you're getting a badge. Yeah, you're getting you're getting a badge, and and this is one of those things where uh, you know it's a limited time thing again. Like a lot of these things, it's June 9th to August 30th. It's tied to this exhibition, um, you know, and I, and I do think that within a certain subset of the population you know showing a badge around is is a little bit of a badge of honor right yeah you know i got this thing and you don't well i think it's it's interesting you know i think that um you know jai ping and and the other 49 location-based services that are that are uh, that have popped up in in uh, in china i think that um I love how they've labeled Jai Peng, uh China's Foursquare. So I think they've labeled a winner already. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, when they call them Chinese Foursquare, but China's Foursquare. But uh, it's interesting to see because they can look across the pond. They can say, "Listen, what has worked in North America?" Because it really, North America for the first time, I think, is a couple of years ahead of uh, the Chinese marketplace when it comes to check-ins, uh, and um, they can look around and see, well, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and and they'll take the best of the best. So. It's interesting that a, that a company like this is with a million users, uh, dominant in brands right now. Yeah. Whereas Foursquare yeah. took them a while to get there. Yeah, and, and and obviously, I mean, the Louis Vuitton thing is is not the first, um, no. you know, first program for Jai Peng. I mean, they've done they've done programs with um, uh, IBM or around ThinkPad. They've done stuff with Yahoo. They've worked with McDonald's. They've worked Starbucks. with Starbucks. You know, a bunch of other brands. So the, these guys have certainly been active um, in, in this space, and you know, yeah, they have only got a million users, but you know, um, I think they worked with Mark Jacobs as well. So, so they they tend to be on on kind of big brands. Well, yeah, it's good, and and uh, I love to see this. Uh, like yeah, as you said, not a uh, not not a mom and pa brand. Um, 
but a, but an actual worldwide uh, exclusive brand like uh, Louis Vuitton. Um, yeah, and so just one last comment on that. I, I mean, I think similar to what we started off with with the Bound City thing uh, yeah. in Indonesia, I, I do think that so much of the focus has been on North America with you know the big platforms, the Foursquares, the Goalas, and, and Europe. Uh, and the scavengers, and it does mean that in some of these other markets, whether it's China or Indonesia or South Africa or wherever, um, it, it creates opportunities for you know new upstarts to to get out there, replicate what they're seeing other in other places, basically be 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 the dominant player in the market, own the market, and just wait for it to get taken out. Uh, you know, when when they decide they want to go go global. I mean, look at Groupon. It's acquisitions, yeah, right. Groupon said, "Look, we want to be Groupon all over the globe," and they're buying all the you know the copycats in all the markets. Yep. It's just a matter of time before Jai Pang and Bound City and all these guys get acquired. Well, I like that. Got to think about what I can do up here in Canada. Come Absolutely, on. I hit the Northwest Territories or something like that and build some build the uh, you know the number one location based service check in platform in the Northwest Territories or Callaway. Yeah. I think that's a winning deal. I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, story number four. Let's talk about the PepsiCo 10 moving to Europe. They ran a successful uh, first uh, first version of this at South by Southwest. Now they're moving to Europe. Let's talk about this. Yes. This is an interesting idea. So, the, so, so I only bring this up, not that it's, it's purely a location-based thing, but for me, this was a very successful program uh, that Pepsi ran last year. And so if you're not familiar with it, basically they said, look, we, we want to fund, you know, cool entrepreneurs, uh, interesting projects, uh, location-based, social media, mobile, uh, you know, all sorts of, of development. And so they had this. They ran a U.S. program last year. About 400 uh, companies applied. They picked 10, uh, and they give them like 25,000 bucks and you know a bunch of support and, and mentors from the company, and 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 they agree to pilot the technology as well. You know, with with Pepsi or one of its sub brands, uh, in some way, and um, and so if you look at the list of the ten from last year, some of those companies we've talked about on this on this show uh, many times. So I'm just going to mention a couple that are specifically have a location element to them. So Isle Buyer, yep. mobile shopping platform, um, tabletop media. Uh, you know, you pay at pay at the table when you're in restaurants. You know, in a location based payment model. Um, Motive Cast, which is a loyalty and reward based mobile gaming solution, uses augmented reality and lo location based services. Um, Miso, uh, we've talked about these guys checking into television shows and content. Um, so, you know, that right there, there's four out of the 10 that have, you know, location based elements. We've talked about them on this thing. They've been successful in, in obviously growing their business beyond piloting under the Pepsi program. And so they've said, hey, this worked well. We want, let's bring this to Europe now and and see what what kind of innovations going on across the pond, and I think it's great. So I guess what they do is they pick they pick the top ten. Uh, after all this, they whittle it down to the top ten, and and uh, for uh, the PepsiCo ten in in the UK in Europe, it's they get uh, ten thousand euros. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Each one of these ten people, ten companies, get ten thousand euros, um, and they participate in this. And I guess they get they get great brand exposure to. Um, certainly through PepsiCo, but also through their partners, because the judges, I guess, on this are like, are, you know, from Wired and a bunch of other uh, high-profile yeah, mashable. Judges. Yeah, yeah, and, and they also have uh, Highland Capitals involved, yeah. uh, OM, OMD is involved. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of players in this. But I think the key thing for a lot of this is, yes, they get ten, ten thousand pounds to mm -hmm. to help them move along, but you know. Like every startup, you're always looking for that big brand, that big customer that you can kind of pilot with and write up the case studies and go and prove to the world that it works. Um, and Pepsi basically saying, hey, we'll be that brand. Um, and yep. these, these 10 companies get to pilot with, with us, with our, with our company, you know, whether that's the, the beverage side or Tropicana or, you know, Frito-Lay or, or whatever. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're piloting with us in some way. You know, and they don't get to choose, which is interesting. So Pepsi will, PepsiCo will choose what brand they get to use. Um, so I went through the terms and conditions, and it's an interesting thing because I always I'm leery about this because even though PepsiCo it's ten thousand pounds, right? Not ten thousand euros. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah, you're right. 
even though that they're they're paying this ten thousand uh, pounds to ten companies, so that's two hundred thousand pounds, right? No, hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, hundred thousand pounds, which is two hundred thousand American dollars um, or Canadian dollars. Uh, that's a small amount of money for the amount of research that they're getting for this, right? So I was thinking in that mind is that listen, you're going to get ten of the most innovative companies in the UK or around Europe, and they're going to be showing you basically full kimono. They're going to be showing you this great technology that you want to be able to leverage and pilot with your brands. So this is this is probably the best dollar spent in research because they get the coolest uh, ideas brought to them, right? No question. So I was no looking question. like, so what are the terms and conditions about this? Is that, uh, you know, they don't take an equity stake in the company. They don't do anything. They don't say, listen, you, you have to be, um, uh, you know, they don't take an equity stake. They don't have any control over the company. They say that, listen, you can't work with another food or beverage brand like us uh, and this one runs till September of 2012. So if you're selected, you're going to get that 10,000 pounds, but yeah. you cannot work with another company like PepsiCo, so i.e. Coke, uh, the Coke brand, until September 2012. So that's but, fine. But there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, nope. you know, I've built a number of, of startups, uh, you know, over the years. And when, you, when you're starting out and you're looking for those initial customers, you know, one of the things that's always on the table with with those big brands is you know okay we will, we'll be your first customer we'll be your second customer whatever it is yeah. but we want six months or a year exclusivity in our category uh, and I think it's I think that that's great uh, and that's fine and that's and that's really all Pepsi is asking for yep but, but it's an interesting thing so th that's not out of the ordinary um, I, I don't think uh, I mean they pay like there's a, per, a perpetual worldwide irrevocable non exclusive um, royalty free license that they get which is you know something so i'm not sure that uh, if they choose this do they pay or not so i'm a little bit uh, blurry on that but one of the things that was interesting it's a clause five on the use it's it's basically that says um participant acknowledges and agrees that as a result of the independent efforts of the sponsors or any of the connected parties the sponsors may have developed or may in the future develop products technologies or other information similar to that disclosed by the participant and participant c shall not make any legal claims against the sponsors or relating right. thereto. So the big, they're covering themselves. They listen, if we like your idea, there's a chance that you cannot come back to us and say, listen, you stole the idea. This is something that, that you've got to sign going into it. And, and I know that that's part of every agreement, but it's a really interesting play because for 200,000 US dollars, PepsiCo is probably going to get the 10 most innovative ideas that I can find and brought into that company. And uh, then they have the kind of the exclusive right to be able to replicate it in a way, shape, or form that suits PepsiCo. So always, you've always got to be leery, not leery, but you've, you've got to understand what you're getting into before you get into these contests because PepsiCo is not a dumb company. And uh, this is a really great way to source out some of the best no, technologies. I think it's good for them, and I and I think it's good. It's good for the uh, for the, you know, for the startups. As long as you know what you're getting into, and uh, yeah. as, as as I said, you know the four, just the four that I mentioned. All four of those companies have been done well, done well yeah. uh, in terms of growing their businesses beyond Pepsi. So well, and uh, you know, to you know, I'm not I'm not the harbinger of bad news, but to to be on PepsiCo's side is that they're not going to do this and ruin any chance of doing it again, right? This is if this is a a, a benefit uh, to PepsiCo, it's going to be a benefit to the companies. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Just read the terms and conditions. Always read the terms and conditions when you get into this. But I like the idea. I like the idea a lot. So our, our last story that we're going to be talking about here is uh, something that you've labeled hyper local marketplaces, which is a pretty, yeah. which which is a, a great, uh, a, an amazing, uh, um, an amazing small industry that's come up and that's cropped up uh, through location based services. Walk us through this. Yeah. So so if you think about marketplaces as as we've come to know them whether you know they be eBay or Craigslist or you know kind of those types of marketplaces what's happened is is there's there's been this movement now to kind of make these really hyper local and local to your you know your your neighborhood your community you know the area around you and so what's happening is is there's a whole new wave of startups that are kind of moving into this and so one of them um uh, a couple of them launched, you know, just this week at TechCrunch and other things. But uh, two I want to mention here in particular. First is is a company called SideSell, which launched this past Tuesday. And so, what SideSell is is a, a marketplace for you know 
concert tickets, you know, hockey game tickets, garage sales, real estate, anything, anything basically you want to sell. It's like Craigslist, but it, it, it's extremely local. And, and so it, it, the way it's described is, is rather than you're, you know, I'm, I jump on the marketplace and I'm looking for hockey tickets, let's say to the game, you know, on the weekend Yep. and somebody's selling them and they're, you know, in, uh, I don't know, an hour's drive away kind of thing just because they're there what 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 this thing allows you to do is basically you know find the stuff on your street you know find them you know in your neighborhood um you know it's purely based on the location elements of, of that so it's a marketplace that's extremely hyper local does that make sense i don't, I don't know if yeah I'm right. I, I mean i think it's like uh you know it's the equivalent to especially around the marketplace side so you know side sale is like uh, garage sales estate sales these are the things yeah. that that are that are uh, community driven or just around your community and I, and I love that it's basically like uh, you know whatever your local uh, neighborhood report is or newspaper is uh, their, their classified section but a little bit easier um, yeah. and there's a bunch of these kinds of things emerging so you know obviously this is about selling stuff we talked about uh, you know platforms uh, in, in earlier episodes you know about uh, you know renting stuff that uh, you know like I've got I've got you know one of those uh, robot vacuums that cleans a house that I use, you know, you know, twice a year and maybe somebody wants to use it so, you know, I can rent it out, you know, to somebody else on the street yep. for a small fee or whatever the, whatever the case might be. So anyways, there's a lot of these kind of hyper-local marketplaces starting to emerge. Another one that came up is a really cool company out of New York called Zarly. And actually, the Zarly team was, was out at uh, the LBMA event on Wednesday night uh, as well. So Matt Wilson and uh, Lily Himmelsbach and some of those folks uh, from Zarly in New York were, were out. Uh, and uh, great little company. And what what this is, this is a hyper-local job marketplace. Um, but mm -hmm. not jobs uh, that, you know, you would find in the classified section over in, in, your, in your newspaper per se, but a peer-to-peer -peer job marketplace. So, you know, you as a user say, hey, here's something I need done, you know, I need somebody to, you know, cut my grass, I need somebody to teach my kid, you know, uh, you know, uh, biology, I need somebody, you know, to be a tutor here for that, I need somebody to go, you know, pick up some groceries for me, whatever it is, you've got these little jobs that you need to get done, and you post them up in this local marketplace, and somebody in your neighborhood says, hey, I can do that, and, uh, you know, w with unemployment where it is, uh, a lot of people sitting on their couches, um, I, I got to think this is a good thing. I like the idea, that, like the peer-to-peer -peer job market is really um, is really a neat idea about technology. I interviewed a company uh, called Air Run. It's based out of yeah. Chicago. Uh, similar, but you know, maybe the twist that they did is that um, it's kind of like uh, the way that Amazon's uh, warehouses work, where uh, when you order a book, uh, it actually routes it to the guy who's closest to that book. So it's a you know it's an efficiency thing where. They don't just send it to a central processor and the guy gets into a truck and goes to find the book. Right. They find the guy who's right next to that shelf and he pulls it off and puts it on his cart. What Air Run does is almost the same thing is, is that when you post a job and say, somebody, please go pick up my dry cleaning, it'll, it'll ping the person that's the closest to proximity to that and, and provided that they've got the app and they want to do the work. It, it kind of creates an efficiency as well. And I, you start to see this and you think, like even with Zarly, um, that that undercurrent of peer to peer job market uh, could really swell into you know additional revenue that's needed for a lot of people during this time. Absolutely, absolutely, I, I, and that's why I really like this. I, th yeah. I think it's it, it is about trying to solve some of that uh, kind of underemployed marketplace. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think this kind of thing can have a huge impact. So so I love what these guys are doing. You know, another a similar another you know just a quick third example off the top of my mind is. This company called Get Around. Have you heard yep. about these guys? Oh yeah, it's an Ottawa. It's an Ottawa entrepreneur, Sam Zaid. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Get Around. You know, basically car rental marketplace. You know, finding a car. You know, just close by. So, you know, you don't need Zipcar and all these things where you have to have you know subscriptions and services. Somebody's got a car. It's sitting in the driveway. Yeah. Hey, I'll lend it to you for an hour. You know, let's work it out. Um, that kind of thing. So that that's a really neat. Uh, I mean, you talk about disruptive, right? Uh, what Get Around is doing. Um, Sam actually lived in Ottawa and then uh, moved out uh, to Silicon Valley to get this funded uh, last December, and uh, just one TechCrunch disrupt, right? 
Yeah. So, so you start to see anyways. that peer-to-peer market, massive. And the implications are incredible because it's not just about peer-to-peer jobs. It's about those kind of things. It's about, you know, immediately renting your car, right? Because you don't need it today. And generating revenue on, on something that would be just an inanimate object in your parking, in your, uh, in your laneway. Love that idea. Love yeah, that absolutely. idea. Absolutely. Or, or even houses like, uh, you know, Air uh, BNB. Yeah. Same thing, right? You know, you know, I'm not using my house. I'm not using my cottage. I'm not using this right now. Somebody's looking for a place to stay. They don't want to pay $600 for a hotel room in New York City. Here you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, Same thing, right? So anyways. Um, love all this stuff. And, and, you know, we should probably dedicate an entire show or a special to what's going on in the peer-to-peer stuff because it's uh, – when you talk about location, uh, it, it's uh, it's it's a massive part, and you know we always talk about reach and frequency, but you know there's another layer to mobile, especially uh, especially around location. Is okay at some point, how do you turn this into a little bit of revenue? How do you convert yeah, uh, and that's reach and frequency these, into revenue? These things are all about you know revenue, yeah. all about flow at least of, of dollars going through a system. So you know, anyways, hyperlocal marketplaces. Check them out if you haven't done it already. Side sell, Zarly, yep. get around. Check these guys out. Yeah, wicked, 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 wicked guys. Love it. Um, well, that's it for the news. But uh, big news this week uh, in announcements around funding and uh, rumors. So let's uh, let's start with uh, let's start with the concrete stuff right now, which which is uh, coupons.com. We know yeah. about this. Yeah, we know about this coupons.com. Um, Sorry, I got this fly apparently. That's uh, <laughs> just floating around. Right. So, uh, coupons.com uh, raised two hundred million this this week uh, on a one billion dollar valuation. Oh my! Uh, you know, so that's that's a valuation that's uh, ten times their projected revenue at a hundred million dollars this year. You know, but hey, good to see they're doing a hundred million dollars in revenue. This is coupons.com is a traditional couponing company. Yeah. Uh, that's you know been in the online couponing space and ha- not a lot written out about this yet. But uh, you know the, the kind of th- the thought process is they're going to use this money to extend what they do in online couponing and uh, you know potentially move into the uh, location-based couponing, Grouponing, Groupon Now type of model. Yeah. Well, you know they. Um this is this is this a, a case of a company that was is because they're in the traditional coupons like it's all kind of like a rising tide raises all ships because Groupon ha- has done what they've done and Living Social is doing what they're doing and all these guys are rising so is it kind of like coupons.com is benefiting as a result of what's going on with all the other side uh, industries yeah. I think so, but I mean, this isn't the first time we've seen this, right? I mean, we, we talked, I don't know what episode it was, but a, a while ago about Valpac, yeah. uh, traditional, you know, direct mail coupons, you know, and part, them partnering with Genio and doing augmented reality coupons and all kinds. So, so absolutely, I think yeah. there's, you're seeing this movement across the space of everybody, you know, just trying to innovate and stay competitive with each other. I just wonder, like, I mean, a billion dollar valuation. Um, hey, but g- g- hey, if you can get it, I know exactly. It's like, <laughs> if they can get it, the other the other thing that I think about often about these companies, um, and it kind of leads into our next story, is that are they are they doing this now because it's a way for for partners to exit, for the investors to exit, right? So, uh, or founders to exit, because I know mm-hmm. that when Groupon raised their last round of almost a billion dollars, something staggering like eighty six percent of it, that's eight hundred and sixty million of the billion dollars that they raised, left the company. Like it right. went out to the founders, it went out to the investors, the original investors. So that that kind of says to me that these guys have already had their exit. And so an IPO, nah, it's not really for them. But they're being opportunistic because maybe they see the writing on the wall that that uh, that the industry is going to change as a result of the big guys. So you know, I, I, when I see a deal like that where a billion dollars comes in and eight hundred plus million goes out, I'm thinking, ah, oh, that that kind of burns my ass a little bit, you know. Because it's not for the growth of the company. It's like I gotta stuff my pockets as quickly as I can because this industry is in turmoil. Who knows what's gonna happen? I yeah, know. yeah. But but also from the investor's perspective, I mean, hey, you know, uh, I've now got you know, obviously it's not one one company, but you know, eight hundred and some odd million to kind of go and fund the next generation of companies again, exactly. right? So, which is what they want to do. Yeah, so. I just it's it's not meant to be that uh, you know uh, if my money if I put money into something like this and it's like what what do you mean it bought you a Lamborghini no 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 
No, no, it's got to go towards, you know, paying your 10,000 sales guys. Anyways, totally off track, but it leads me to this kind of Yelp conversation that we hear floating around right now. Yeah, so lots of rumors going on with Yelp. Um, you know, they're, they've got about 50 million users now, 17 million reviews each month. Um, according to That's according to TechCrunch. Um, they say they're going to hit about 100 million in revenue this year, so similar to coupons.com. In, in terms of revenue numbers, mm-hmm. and they, uh, I, you know, the rumors are they're hungry to IPO, like they're they're just dying to IPO. They're out uh, in the marketplace looking for a, a CFO right now who's got public company uh, background. Um, I think a lot of this is you know the, people have been seeing what LinkedIn did, and people yeah. have been seeing what's going on, and and I, I think the market is we, we are a little bit in that hype cycle right now. Of uh, deals are happening, IPOs are happening again. Uh, you know, there was a long time where everything was really quiet. And what uh, do you mean that the dark ten years? The dark Just ten those? years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but but I think we've kind of emerged yeah, in some respects, and and the money's flowing. Yeah. And so pe- people want to, uh, you know, Yelp's been around for a while, right? It's uh, it, it, like you said. There's some investors that are sitting there going. We'd like to we'd like to get something out of this thing, and uh, now's the time to do it before it kind of tanks again. Well, you know, uh, extracting money is very important in the ecosystem, and you have to take money out of companies that it's been sitting there for such a long time, even if you just get your money back, because that's what's going to kind of spur on additional investment. Is that uh, it's kind of it's buoyancy, and we haven't had any exits, so a lot of guys have been sitting yep. there doing nothing uh, with their cash. Um, so, so I have nothing against exits at all. I think that, that you've got to do this yep. to kind of you know, foster innovation and foster future investment. So I, I'm good on it, uh, provided that the business model is sound and provided that, you know, it's, it's a good business. I keep coming back to Groupon. Groupon IPO, doing an IPO, having lost $580 million in the last quarter, you know, uh, never been profitable. Uh, not a real company. Like, this is not something that you would put money in because... They haven't proven the value, and it's all based on human capital. It's like no, know. it's yeah, I, I don't get that one, but you know, and, and I think you know, for me, I, I see the investors in Yelp wanting to get something out of it, yep. and so I see that that side of you know, the, I do. The yep. You put it in to get it out, but 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 I don't see this being successful. I don't see Yelp surviving no. in, in today's uh, economy and, and and the way location based services and. Uh, recommendation engines and all these things are going. I, I I just don't get it. I mean, the only way Yelp can do that is 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 to actually keep the money in the company if yes. they do do this, and actually go and buy some real technology and some patents and some stuff and and actually move forward. Well, uh, uh, in a different way, but to keep doing what they're doing, um, uh, yeah, I don't I don't get it. Anyways, so that's that's Yelp. Uh, Coupons.com, two hundred million on a one million or one billion valuation. Yelp talking about IPO and the one last thing I want to throw in there too because I just saw this and it kind of blew me away um, and I don't have any data on it but there was there's all the talk going on about Microsoft uh, buying Nokia mm-hmm. and then um, I saw a story uh, last night that Samsung is now at, talking yeah. is now talking about taking out Nokia so, so just their mobile their mobile division right they, yeah and they don't want the, yeah. the tires or anything like that but that's huge yeah. Well, uh, competition for that company is good. Yeah, I, I just don't. Uh, I mean, Nokia's only asset really is their distribution channel. Yeah, right. I mean, well, the, okay. So the OVO store, though. I mean, you got to think about it. They're still the the dominant uh, mobile phone out there. I mean, they're they're roughly around forty percent. They're declining very quickly. Yeah, yeah, but the do- the dominance comes from the distribution channel. Yep. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. it's because they yeah. have those carrier relationships. It's because they have that that distribution network that they have, um, and, and I think that's what you're buying at the end of the day. Yeah, you, you I mean, you are, and you're. Uh, I don't, I don't know that that's a fit. Maybe that's a big rumor, but uh, you know, it, it certainly we'll fits see. in Microsoft much better. We'll see. I just, I just wanted to throw it out there. Something that you're a mobile guy, so uh, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I love the hardware rumors. Um, um, 
And if anybody's interested in Nokia getting a little bit of insight, I'd, I'd go to Tomi Ahonen's blog. Just uh, do a search for Tomi yeah. Ahonen, who's an ex-Nokia uh, VP, and he has a hate on for Stephen Elop, who's a Canadian who runs Nokia. He's the, he's the CEO that came in, and he's an ex-VP of Microsoft, uh, very chummy with Microsoft. Uh, he was also the CEO of, uh, no, uh, not Nokia, but uh, Macromedia. Right. Uh, or Adobe. Adobe, I think. Uh Actually, Macromedia, who bought it, who was bought by Adobe, but um, he's a very he loves he loves Microsoft. Um, so go and read Tommy's blogs. You'll get some deep insight into that. He's not a big fan of uh, of Stephen Elop. I, I want to come back to the um, uh, just one thing about the valuation about uh, Yelp. It's funny because Coupons.com was valued at had a value of a billion dollars after this last investment of two hundred million. And according to everything that I can find, uh, Yelp's valuation is $500 million with almost the same revenue numbers. Mm. Isn't that interesting, right? So, mm. you know, I, I, uh, I, I might be with you on this, is that the market's not responding to what Yelp is doing. And in 2008, after a $15 million investment into Yelp, their market value was $200 million. So that's not like, a, you know, that's not a, a big hockey stick. I mean... Well, remember, like, so TechCrunch says they're doing 17 million reviews a month. Yeah. On the system. And remember, you know, Google launched their, uh, you know, their platform and kind of like outpaced that in two months. Yeah. It's, uh, right. Yeah. So no, it doesn't look good for them. Doesn't look good for them at all. So might as so, well go IPO. Go IPO, get some value for the original investors, get out. Go and do Tank something else. Company. Don't invest in it, though. No. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Let, uh, yeah. So we'll watch this, obviously, as we go. We, we talk about 2011 as being the year of consolidation. We've seen a lot of it, um, the year of the exit. We've seen a lot of it. We're going to see the year of the going out of business. We're going to see a lot of that coming in the second half as well. But not this company as our product of the week. I think we both have, we, we both like this product. Airand. Yeah, Airand. <laughs> Arand, A I R R A N D. I love like, the names these guys come up with, right? But like, like Arand, but Air, uh, yeah. Arand, um, yeah, I get it. Um, you know, <laughs> but there's also Air Run, and then there's I, I don't know. Anyways, so what is it? It's um, it, well, let me, I'll read you the description that I that I got here. A web application that follows your location check-ins and notifies you by email or SMS when you check in somewhere. With an associated item to do, so what what this is is um, a to do list that's tied to physical locations. So what you do is is you know just like you would check into Foursquare um, at your grocery store, you would basically say, hey, you know, you you would make a little note that says, hey, I got to pick up milk or I got to do this or I got to do that uh, at the grocery store, and you would affix that to that particular location. And so when you walk into that location. Um, and you don't even have to check in in this in, per se. Uh, it basically pushes you an SMS or email reminder to your mobile device that says, "Hey, oh, you're you're in the grocery store, and you you left this note for yourself tied to this location that you you got to remember to pick this stuff up." So it's, I think it's an interesting thing. And and what's most interesting about it is iOS five, which is coming soon to an Apple uh, phone near you. Uh, has this feature inherently built in, this this kind of push lo notification around location capability built into that OS. Uh, yes. So that's effectively what a lot of these guys are doing. You know, and, and I think that that, um, well, you know, I, I, I like this concept. I, you know, I've always thought about this uh, around uh, technology that allows me to forget things. Like, you know, I'm a big, uh, uh, you know, getting things done kind of guy where, uh, I, I like to dump it in some place and then, uh, you know, have it notify me when I need to know about it. But oftentimes I dump it into my system and then I just leave it there forever. It just stews. So I like the idea about, you know, tying it into checking in. So either Foursquare, Gowal or Places or anything like that where I've said, listen, um, I need to remember that. Um, and I need to remember it only there. So just remind yeah, me. I like that. And I'll give you a perfect example of how I would use this because, you know, I travel a lot. Uh, for me, the interesting thing would be, okay, you know, I show up at the airport, as soon as I show up at the airport, push me my, you know, flight information, yep. you know, like whatever it is. Yeah, you know? my ticket. 
my, my, my e-ticket, my, my this, my, you know, like whatever, just send me all the stuff I need. Or, you know, I arrive in the city, push me to my hotel with the address and, and everything else that I need. So it's right there. I don't have to go open up, you know, my email and look for the confirmation email. I don't have to go look, you know, whatever, just push, push me the, the details of, of whatever it is relevant to those locations. I think that it's cool. And, and by the way, these guys aren't the only one, but no. uh, there's another one called GeoReam. Uh, which has been out for a while that does very similar. There's actually a Toronto company called TaskAv, yeah. which uh, does something very similar to this as well. So uh, there's a bunch of these kind of location-based uh, to-do, uh, you know, reminder systems. And What's different about this is, is that it, it, the push it, it's a push reminder over SMS or email tied to those locations or to those check-ins. The, the key for this has absolutely got to be so uh, a really close integration with Foursquare or a check-in software. So basically, it's like uh, it's almost like a desktop piece of software that would that brings in and it's like an API that goes yep. in your mail system or your calendar. And it would be, and and it brings in all the locations that you've ever checked in, so that you can do it in natural language conversion. So I, basically, you type it in like, you know, pick up milk from Loblaws or something like that, and it knows that. Listen, the Loblaws you're talking about is on Woodruff, and you know, it says it knows that when you check in with Foursquare, like it has to be that kind of natural confluence of all the stuff that you bring in to make this very effective. Yeah, having another system is very difficult, but. I love the way that this starts, but natural language. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I love it. So Air Rand, A I R R A N D dot com. Go check them out as our product of the week. And last but not least, man, this is why we shouldn't do this late at night. We we I tend to ramble late at night, uh, you know. Uh, so our last piece is our resource of the week. And yeah. This is cool. But, yeah. But nothing spectacular. Nothing spectacular. It's just uh, you know it, it's been floating around Twitter this week. Uh, you, you know, a, a blog post by a guy by the name of Sean Clark, and it's called "The 14 Best Location-Based Marketing Apps for Business." Mm. What I like about it is that if you're new to this space, if you have, if you're one of those people who hasn't been watching the past 29 episodes of this week in location-based marketing, um, uh, and and you're just tuning in now. Or you're just getting up to speed on what's going on in all of this, or you're just thinking about, you know, how do I get started in this space? Um, what What's nice about this is this little blog post kind of wraps up in, in these fourteen uh, recommendations. It, you know, it's got all the basics covered: in it, the four squares, the goalas, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it yeah, it's got a summary of fourteen because he could only find fourteen, is my guess. Right? I guess. I don't know. Well, but. yeah. I mean, I'm going to read them off. But uh, Foursquare, Gowalla, Groupon, Google Places, Google Offers, which uh, Facebook Places, um, Scavenger, Shopkick, Voucher Cloud, Urban Spoon, Looped, Brightkite, Yelp, and Where. So, I mean, it's not, they're not, uh, you know, they're not browbeating. He's not coming up with anything that's unique or anything, but it's a good introduction. Yeah, it's a good introduction, you know, and obviously it's not completely you know accurate you know it's not a complete list uh, it's a good introduction yeah you know and, and you know what i mean by that is is you know even if you take the, like the last one where you know it's it's not where anymore it's ebay yeah. right so um yeah well yeah. but you know it's a good start and i think that this is something that the lbma should be doing it should be doing like the top 3 list or the top 5 list of uh you know of uh, most shh, relevant shh. okay don't give away our secrets nothing i'll just <laughs> edit that out no i won't i'm kidding i'm kidding uh, yeah, we are actually uh, working on something that I can't say too much yet about, but um, yeah, there's something coming shortly that's kind of along these lines of, you know, kind of uh, get started, uh, let's call it uh, get started videos. Hey, I just outed the LBMA. Sorry, Asif. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it for episode number 29. Um, you're going to be gone this week. We're going to catch up next, uh, back to our regular time next next Sunday, I think, um, a little bit earlier so we don't ramble as much, um, but uh, certainly on a Saturday night. Uh, so you're going to be gone to Banff this week at the, what is this conference you're going to? It's called the Banff World Television Festival. Yes. Well, and it should be good. The confluence of television and content and location, very important, very important. That gap from the couch to the TV, short distance, deep, deep, deep crevice. And uh, I think that, you know, it's good that uh, they, they got somebody like you in there uh, preaching 
preaching that convergence between content and location. Love it. Um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely it's definitely happening, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good discussion around this topic uh, at the conference this year. And this is a conference that's very very mature. Like this, it's over thirty years. This conference has been happening in Banff, um, and this this is my fourth year there, and uh, I, I think it'll be be really interesting because we've you know it, it used to be two conferences that ran kind of back to back, the television side, and then a conference that they started a few years ago called Next Media, which was like the online television, like the Hulus and all that kind of stuff. And and then two years ago, they smashed it all together because it, it didn't really make sense to separate, you know, traditional television from kind of new media. No. Nope. And so now it's all one. And, um, and it's amazing because, like, you get everybody in the same room together. Um, you know, and the movie side, too. So all the, all the production houses, Paramount, you know, all these guys are up. You know, CBS, ABC, NBC, they're all there, Fox. Hmm. They all come up for this, and it's huge. See, that would be great. Now what they've just got to do is start smashing them <clears throat> with with the mobile guys in there as well, uh, like you, like a bunch of other people well, in there. Yeah, just... like I said, there's a lot of those guys up there as well. Yeah, that's so. good. Well, I can't wait and to hear it, what goes on there. Yeah, even radio. Like, I mean, a lot of the satellite guys and, yeah. and things like that. So, Oh, those guys. Those guys. Oh, where the noose is tightening around their neck right now. And I feel yeah, that yeah, way. yeah, especially the satellite radio guys. HD radio. Yeah, HD radio. It's like, huh? HD radio. Well, yeah. and uh, yeah, especially with the cloud announcements from Apple this week, and and about you know what what uh, Google's doing and what Amazon's doing, it's like, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough uh, for those guys going forward. So uh, let's get a rundown of this next week when we do episode number thirty. Sound like a good plan? Absolutely. So this has been this week in location based marketing episode number twenty nine. You can find Asif at uh, thelbmay.com or at Asif R. Khan on Twitter or at thelbma on Twitter. You can find me at untether.tv, probably where you found this. Uh, leave a comment. Leave a message. You can you can reach out by email at untether at gmail.com or you can reach out to Asif at asif at thelbma.com. We'd love to hear some feedback. We got a great co- quote, a great comment uh, from a, an avid listener. I really appreciate hearing that kind of stuff. It gives us a little bit of... Uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, we love sharing the enthusiasm and uh, we love this industry and we want to hear back from what you guys and uh, how we're doing and how we're covering it and any ideas that you might have for the show. We welcome it. So until then, our next episode next week, episode number 30, have a great one. We'll see you guys next week on uh, This Week in Location-Based Marketing. Thanks, Asif. Yeah, take care. Have a great week.